And I just thought genes were my destiny, right? We all end up think it's in our genes. We're destined to have diabetes or high cholesterol or heart condition. But then once I looked at lifestyle side of things beyond just the nutrition is when I was fully able to get off of everything. And my Hashimoto's is in remission. And, and even in the wintertime, I'm outside tank top and barefoot feet to the ground. Like I said, it's my non-negotiables. And then seeing sunrise with the naked eye. That is really key because a lot of people don't you realize how many of their hormones are regulated off of circadian rhythm as well. Welcome. We have one of our longtime members and coaches, uh, Becky Niles with us today. Becky, thanks for being here. You look great, by the way. I hadn't seen you in a little while, so it looks like you're, still, you're aging in reverse, as most of us carnivores seem to do. So good for you. Good to have you here. Absolutely. And after... Four years of being with the company. Thanks for finally doing this. I'm privileged to be on. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those things where it's, there's like a lot of people I should, you know, I, I can't believe I not talked to them yet, but I sometimes I forget who I've talked to. No, I haven't. But you're still out in Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I am middle of beef cattle country. Yeah, that's a good place. So it, it always feels good. When I drive around where I live, I see cows in the field. I'm like, oh, it makes me feel better for some reason. I don't know. It just gives you that sort of a little bit of sense of security. I guess if things go south, you can go <laughs> right around and get some cows, maybe, <laughs> who knows. I think we wanted, I guess, let's just maybe, since people haven't heard this before, why don't we, why don't we just get a little bit into your story and tell us where you, your background, how you got into nutrition in general and, and the things you've done and tried and how things have gone for you. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So Obviously, when I was in high school, I thought I was healthy because I was skinny, right? But then I ended up and was on standard American diet, obviously hormonal birth control at that point, which will come into the story later. 2002, had my first child, ate like most first time moms eating for two, gained a bunch of weight. I never lost that weight either. And then fast forward into 05, got pregnant again with my son gained even more weight. So at this point, I'm well over 200 pounds. Tried everything. At that point, I became even Weight Watcher lifetime member. Tried calories in, calories out, shakes, bars, etc. You name it, I probably tried it. There's also many metabolic conditions within my family as well. And I just thought genes were my destiny, right? We all end up think it's in our genes. We're destined to have diabetes or high cholesterol or heart conditions. And it so my dad was a very brittle type two diabetic, and I started to deal with digestive IBS conditions, cardiac asthma issues. Then I ended up on halter monitors and stress tests. Again, hormonal issues still plagued me. I did get pregnant with my third child, but I had to have progesterone shots three times a week in order to carry her to term because of the uterine lining. I have uterine cancer in my family too. So after I had her a couple of years later, I ended up having a complete full hysterectomy, double oophorectomy. For those that don't know, that means they took both ovaries. HRT, hormonal replacement therapy, made me sick. Sicker than a dog, actually. I felt worse after all of that. And at that point, I'm only 29 years old. And I'm dealing with hormone issues, gaining weight, asthma, cardiac, prediabetes. My A1C is climbing. So of course, I trusted the medical system. And I went to a doctor that I thought had my health in the best interest, but I ended up on corticosteroids, bronchodilators, SSRIs, laxatives for the IBS. And then I also had thyroid uh, autoimmune issues, which was Hashimoto's and was on levothyroxine. Needless to say, by the time I was 30, I was on seven pharmaceutical medications. I started to look at the toxic load in my lifestyle. And the reason why I say that my first gateway into this was 2016 by essential oils. And that's when I started to look at, okay, what's in my food? What's in everything else? Started on whole food keto. And then I found you in 2018 on Instagram. And I, again, I'm in the middle of Nebraska. I have cows in my backyard, right? Not necessarily mine, they're the neighbors. So I can't just go eat one. But in 2018, I decided I'm going to jump in with you, start to do carnivore. And it was like November 
And I did stay keto through the holidays, but then during World, World Carnivore Month in 2019, I started jumping in with just the steaks, meat only. I did World Carnivore Month for January. And needless to say, I spent two and a half years full carnivore at that point. And I think it was October timeframe when we, so the downfall with that, when I first jumped in, it was great. I felt full. I felt satiated. But my A1C did start to climb. And that's when I got my first CGM and my glucose was like 180, 200. Mm. I switched my macros around and did the higher fat. That worked. Um, and it has worked successfully for me ever since. I lost the weight. My hormones are balanced. I'm off all pharmaceutical medications. Now I did in, so that was the high fat carnivore up until we did the, I call it an experiment. In October of 2020, where we shifted the macros, we increased the fat. I had the CGM and everything. And like I said, that was 2020. My A1C did come down. But then once I looked at lifestyle side of things beyond just the nutrition is when I was fully able to get off of everything. And my Hashimoto's is in remission and A1C last I checked it was 4.8. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Let me ask you. You said you'd reached, I think, 200 pounds at one point. How, how, do you mind how much are you down from that, if you don't mind sharing? Over 60 pounds. Oh, wow. And I've okay. maintained that loss. Okay. And, and you're what, like five, eight? Five, some, eight. Five, eight, mm-hmm. something like that. So, yeah, it's a pretty kind of normalish body weight now. So, that's awesome. And it's interesting because so you had these relatively 180s, 200s, is definitely high glucose. And you were doing carnivore at the time. What were you eating at that time? You said you'd shifted to a higher fat ratio. So you were eating maybe a little bit more protein, perhaps. Is that what you're doing or what was going on? At, the, at that point, when I was doing getting those glucoses, I was actually just doing steak. Mm-hmm. So I would end up and get a package of steak out. I would eat three meals a day and it was just steak. I wasn't adding fat at that point. It wasn't until I started to add the fat, do the beef suet, do the whipped tallow sticks, those type of things that I started to see the glucose come back down. And ultimately it was even in the eh, somewhere about sixties to 75 most consistently. Yeah. I remember you doing those things. We were talking about blood glucose and you remember, I think it was 2019, 2020. I did something similar, very high fat. I like you saw extremely low blood glucose and I lost a lot of weight. For me, I lost a little bit more lean mass than I wanted to. So that wasn't my particular preference. And and we can talk about I mean, recently, I've gone higher fat for a reason. We can talk about that. But let me ask you, you said you had a history of brittle diabetes in your dad. I think you just said you were likely pre-diabetic. And it's funny because, you know, you go to the doctor and I said, here's a pill for that, that, this and that symptom. And so when you look at it in a rearview mirror, it's like, this was all the same thing you were treating, but you were just weekly treating, barely treating some of the symptoms and not actually dealing with that. What, what had your diet been while you were sick, while you were 200 pounds and you're pregnant, probably, I don't imagine you eating a bunch of junk food, but what had your diet been to, to get you in that position? I would say it was off and on standard American diet. Like I said, I did weight watchers, lost weight with that. But of course that was a lot of chicken breast and salad, right? Anything that was pretty much lean or low calorie because it was less points. I got into weight watchers when it was the point system. And so same thing with like proteins, very modified fast, the low fat, high protein doesn't work for me either. My mood starts tank energy tanks. But during that time frame, it was more standard American diet or shakes per se. My mom was on slim fast. So I would end up stealing some of her slim fast shakes or the powder. But yeah, it was definitely not not healthy. Look, like you said, looking back, seeing the symptoms as a red flag of, hey, don't just treat it with pharmaceuticals and a Band-Aid. Let's look at a root cause here. And that's when I like said looked at cellular health instead. So you said you, you initially went carnivore, st- straight up steaks for, for a period of time. You did notice some benefit with that. What, what were the things that benefited that? And then what were the things you were residually left with that you were able to fix by adjusting your macros and doing some other lifestyle related things? Pretty much I ended up only doing the steak only up until January because January of 2019 was my first CGM. That's when I ended up and shifted because I knew in 2018 when I did keto for a little uh, short period, I knew what it could end up and be with the high fat. I 
have a book that is ketogenic diets for therapeutic treatment. Mm -hmm. And so I knew doing like a two to one, a three to one of the fat protein in my keto days. Now I still did end up and have the carbs in there during that stint, but I knew what my glucose could be. I was using keto mojo then. So that's what I went back to when I switched over in January with the CGM and did my first stint or run with the CGM as far as shifting those macros. I'm like, hey, if the higher fat side works in keto, then let's see if it works in carnivore. And that's when I shifted was January of 2020 for World Carnivore Month. So I only had two months with the protein. Got it. What okay. got better was the satiety. I was definitely stuffed and full. But yeah, it wasn't really until I shifted those macros that I seemed to benefit. Did you find that with the fat, the, was that also satiety provo- producing for you? Did you find that I was also like, hey, I'm pretty full of this too? I'm pretty full with it. It is definitely a satiety factor and the volume or the composition of the meal definitely looks different. So I do pull that protein back to more of an adequate protein amount and the high fat. So I reference it like a seesaw, if you will, where the protein comes back to adequate. Now, of course, you can end up and go by several different influencers or doctors in regards of what they consider an adequate amount. Mm -hmm. But I do end up and pull that back and do the higher fat. And I'm just as satiated on less volume than before. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the key there is if I think a lot of these things is if your food is not keeping you, if you're hungry all the time, it's just going to just gonna continue to eat and it's going to be hard. So you got to find something that does that. Let me ask you about, you said you, you've done the, the shift of the fat ratios and then I know you do, I know you're out grounding and you do some other, you've experimented some other things. Oh, one thing I would ask about the fat, you'd mentioned tallow and other things, like suet and tallow and stuff like that. Dairy fats, a lot of people will go to butter. Is that something you've utilized? I know, I think we talked about using that. Did, what was the impact of that on you? And what are your thoughts on using dairy fat for you in particular or anybody else? So it depends on the dairy fat, right? If you're going to end up and use butter or ghee, then I do see success with my clients. But if they're starting to use things like cream, cheese, sour cream, those sources of dairy fat, then it tends to end up and be problematic for them. And it's really a slippery slope too, because they overindulge in it. When I've done the CGM, I'm no longer wearing a CGM at this point, but when I was wearing it, I did notice that the glucose trended higher with the dairy fat in addition to just animal source beef fat. Okay, fair enough. And so let's talk about some of the other lifestyle things you've added in there. I've seen you do grounding. I've seen you do exercise. I can't, maybe some red light stuff. What do you, what do you, what is your comprehensive things that you have found to be and rate them based on your perception of effectivity. Like some things you do, and like, yeah, I can't tell if it did any different. Some things are like dramatically, yes, this, this clearly worked for me. What, what, what's your impression of those things? So my non-negotiables are my grounding and my circadian rhythm. I do focus on what I call the six intuitive steps. So sleep is in there. Grounding is in there. A proper circadian rhythm. Um, nutrition is one, definitely one piece of the puzzle. I have been able to add food back and we can get into that too, but The stress management is really pivotal in regards of the thyroid aspect and the adrenals. And then also, yeah, the grounding side of things. I get up every morning and see the sunrise and put my feet to the ground. Those are my two non-negotiables. It don't matter if I'm traveling or if I'm at home, I'm out there. Now, I also do the seasonal cold exposure. Like right now, Nebraska is cooling off. We've had Eh, upper 30s, 40s in the mornings. I'm, and even in the wintertime, I'm outside tank top and barefoot feet to the ground. Like I said, it's my non negotiables. And then seeing sunrise with the naked eye. That is really key because a lot of people don't realize how many of their hormones are regulated off of circadian rhythm as well. So seeing the sunrise and seeing the UVA light is very important when it comes to. I say the four key hormones, which is cortisol, leptin, melatonin, and then insulin. So those are definitely regulated also by circadian rhythm as well. Yeah. And there's obviously ways to hack those things. A lot of people talk about supplemental light, blue blocking glasses or red light things. But in your opinion, probably the best thing is going straight to the source and getting out in the sunlight and watching watching the sun, maybe watching the sunrise, watching the sunset. You, that's probably the more superior way. Would you agree with that? I like the blue blockers and I'm not against them. Normally, if you would see me in an evening meeting, I'm sitting in a red light, not in necessarily this bright light. 
but I always go with nature is free. So if we can end up and get out there, the sun provides us with all the spectrum of light that we end up when we need. So if we can get out there around sunrise, it's predominantly red light. If we can get out there, the sunlight is like a barcode and it changes as the sun comes up over the horizon. So it gives us the vitamin D aspect. If you can get skin in the game and have that sunlight hitting your skin during the daytime. And then also the benefit of sunset. So there's four key times, sunrise, UVA, UVB, and then sunset. And that signals for the body to prepare it for that intensity of light. But then also the sunset says, okay, it's time to wind down. Don't expose yourself to overhead artificial light in the evening time. That's disruptive. That's where the blue blockers come in. But like I said, normally I'm in red light or at least have the lights off. So yeah, it's only it's four 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 forty p.m. where I'm at, so it's still still daytime for. So I know you're in Nebraska, so you're two hours ahead of me. But what about? Let me just go back to the grounding because this is something that I've I've touched on a little bit before. But for the people who don't aren't really barefoot on the grass or barefoot on something, some surfaces don't ground and some do. Maybe you could go into that a little bit. And what is what are the sort of known better? Because there are actually some studies, some literature that have done this and have looked at inflammatory response, but. What do you mean by grounding specifically? What actually works? And what do you think the perceived benefits or what do you think the, the, the benefits that we've been described are? Yes, grounding on bare feet or hands, any of your skin, it is an instantaneous process. So any of your skin that can touch one of those natural surfaces, the only surfaces that will not ground you are dead wood. So things like a wooden deck is not going to end up and be conductive. Sealed concrete, asphalt, is not conductive surfaces. So if it's a natural stone or natural like concrete, we'll actually end up and ground you. It's not as conductive as grass, sand, soil, dirt, or bodies of water. The benefits is the electron, which I go into the whole like fourth phase water, which is I've learned through like Gerald Pollock and my circadian or my quantum biology certification. But the exclusion zone water does end up and build. We gain that energy, mitochondrial energy from those electrons. We also end up and get a anti-inflammatory or pain reduction aspect. The blood is more free flowing as well. So there's many more benefits in regards of the reactive oxygen species and other benefits, inflammation. What about dosage? Is there a dosage time? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes? What's a, do we know? I try to get 15 to 20 minutes cumulative throughout the day. So it's not necessarily if it's 20 below outside, I'm not going to end up and stand out there and get frostbite. I'll go out and I'll still do it. I'm the weirdo with two heads that is outside in the snow and making snow angels barefoot and in a tank top just to prove that I'm getting my grounding and I'm getting cold exposure. So barefoot in the snow, snow conducts. It's water, basically. Well, as you say, it's water. And yeah. if you've ever touched anything, say an electrical fence and your feet are in water, you're going to end up and have more of an intensity of the zap. Water is conductive. So things like lakes, rivers, those type of things are actually more conductive surfaces than dried out soil that we've obviously had throughout this drought the last few years here in Nebraska. But yes, what surfaces are more conductive? You may, I remember you're making all these sort of whipped tallow and other sort of things. Have you refined that anymore? You got you, the recipes pretty much what they were two or three years ago, still studying you. Yep. The videos are still up on my YouTube. The whipped tallow, I've actually gotten, when I first made the video, I did add flavoring to it. Some people, when they're starting out, they're like, yeah, I can't just do fat. But at this point, I just end up and whip the tallow. I just made some actually this morning. Because the last few days, I've fried up some what I call beef crack. It's basically just <laughs> fried beef fat with some salt. To me, it's very addicting. I can eat three, four ounces in a setting. And there are days where I'll be doing some fat fasting. And that's essentially what I eat in a day. Yeah, uh, explain fat fasting. It means you, you just eat a little bit of fat and that's your whole food for the day. Is that right? Yeah, so I actually created a masterclass in regards to fat fasting. And I put four different levels because if I end up and I tell someone, hey, we're going to end up in fat fast. Oh, by the way, we're only eating beef suet, right? They're going to be like, yeah, no, sorry, I'm out. So I did tear it into a level where you're wa- working your way up to a traditional fast. But it does date back to the Keckwick diet back in 1953. 
So it's even before Atkins and modified Atkins and all of that. Keckwick and Braun ended up and basically come up with it in the 50s. And it is eating fat or bridging it with a fat. So you're jumpstarting your body into lipolysis by giving it those fatty acids and essentially training your body that, hey, we're going to end up in burnt fat for fuel. And then as you are in ketosis at that point and get further into it, then the autophagy kicks in and you start to burn your own body fat. All right. So I guess, well, let me, the high fat approach, I, I know there's a lot of you know people, they don't, some people don't like it. Some people prefer it. I've, I've been doing this long enough where I see some people absolutely thrive on that. Yet there's other people that don't. And in my sort of experience, I think people with sort of neurologic issues, maybe some hormonal issues, those seem to be particularly suited to that. I think women may be geared more to higher fat than men do in some cases. What has been your experience with that? Do you find that everybody just thrives on 90% fat or what do you, or what, what and you say two to one, three to one, that's two, two grams of fat per every one gram of protein, I'm assuming that, that gets into a very high percentage, three grams per, you're like 90% of your calories come from fat at that point. What do you think, who do you think does best on this sort of approach? Or do you even have any thoughts on that? Exactly what you said. So people that have some form of a metabolic condition, especially in the females that have your sex hormones dysregulated, because the backbone, if you look at a hormonal cascade is the cholesterol, and it does truly end up in help with making like the pregnenolone, making the vitamin D, making it all stems off the backbone of cholesterol. And I really see a success in it also with my diabetics. Now I will stop and say I am not a medical professional, but With that being said, my clients that are diabetic work well with their endocrinologists in regards of what they're doing. And I actually have a diabetic that has started doing the higher fat. She's actually 85%. So not everyone has to be the 90% or more. Some people thrive on just an 80%. Some people are more 85. And she's actually decreased her insulin from bolusing seven to eight or eight to nine units down to one to two at a meal in just a matter of a month and a half. So she's seeing real good success with that. Now she does still have an insulin pump. She, it quit working overnight the other night. She did wake up with an 86 fasting glucose without the pump. So the pump malfunctioned, but she's doing really well with that. So I do see it in other type one, type twos, but primarily it's anyone that has a hormonal issue or like MS, autoimmune, those type of conditions. And as you said, you've been able to add some foods back in. Let's go into that a little bit. But this is something that I think is, when I talk about a carnivore diet, I wrote the book and people look to me for sometimes for guidance, but I really use, I think of it as a therapeutic tool and it may be time limited. It may be six months, maybe a year, it may be 10 years for some people, maybe the rest of their life. But if you look at it from that perspective, there are people that, you know, can adapt. And like, I know a lot of people have been able to successfully bring back in other foods. Some have not. Some clearly, they do it and they just struggle and it's a disaster. But what have you what have you been able to change over the past four years or so, four or five years now? So when I first started adding things back in, it was because of Ben Bickman. He put out an article in regards of other chains of fats. So getting like the short chain and the medium chain. That was the first article that I had seen. And that was in March of 2021. And 20, yes, 2021. And so I started to add the fat back in. Of course, then I looked towards the diabetic population and the therapeutic population as far as, okay, what are they doing? What can I end up and extract from them? Because they in the keto space. And that's when I ended up and I come across a little girl that was doing ketosis for epilepsy. And she was adding olive oil. She was adding avocado oil, the other chains of fats, MCT oil. So that's what I started with. And then I went to the foods associated with that. But then as I finished up my certification with quantum biology, I started to look at foods differently and the code that we can end up and get in our gut and the gut diversity from the foods that we're consuming. Obviously, I'm not meant in the middle of Nebraska to be consuming a pineapple or a mango or something. It doesn't grow naturally in my light coat. And so that's when I switched over to more of a seasonal, local seasonal, what I can either grow on my deck or go to a farmer's market and get. 
those are the foods that I end up and I consume. So it does still limit it for me as far as what I am consuming. But I have the first year or I would say the first six months, I was able to incorporate things like an avocado or a coconut and I did fine with it, but it was more looking at it from a circadian perspective that I transitioned. Yeah. When you talk about quantum biology or quantum nutrition, you're, I guess you're assuming you're talking how light also impacts our food choices, right? So if you're living in Canada, you're probably not eating mangoes or you shouldn't be perhaps, and perhaps there's some negative effects associated with it. And I've seen some people talking about something with, there's some thoughts around deuterium and there's all kinds of different sort of thoughts that go into that. Let me ask you about ketosis. Do you find, do you think that the act of having circulating beta hydroxybutyrate is itself therapeutic? Or do you think that the things you do to get into ketosis, the absence of certain foods, the, you know, the longer periods of going without eating, or do you think that's what's driving it? What are your thoughts on that? I think it all plays a role in it. So it's not because I could end up and just sit here and eat gobs of fat and produce the ketones, but that still doesn't X out the fact of how important movement is, how important sleep is, how important giving your digestive system a break. I'll end up and I'll talk in our meeting on carnivore.diet in the eat fat and thrive, or even the fasting meeting in relationship to giving the digestive system a break or in our sleep meeting of how it can improve sleep by spacing the meals out anywhere three to four hours. But we've actually seen it even in people up to six hours at improving their sleep. So I think it does end up and go into a wholesome lifestyle, which is why I look beyond the nutrition as far as these other factors and how they're important into it also. Because otherwise, also things like a ketone supplement could end up and be used or like I said, just jacking your fat up and getting those ketone productions. But it does end up, in my opinion, take the other aspects that we do to produce those ketones as well. Do you, just speaking of ketone supplements, do you find any utility in those? Do you think there's any place for a ketone supplement? I think supplements have their time, their place and their purpose, right? For me personally, no. For people that are using it more for things like epilepsy or, you know, that, but I'm not a fan of something that I can get my body to do naturally and boosting it. I've actually seen people get a lightheaded, almost a buzz type feeling from the ketone supplements just because of the rush. Now, like I said, some people would end up and consider things like even the MCT oil, a ketone supplement, but I'm talking the actual ketone esters, ketone salts, where they end up and actually have a negative for some people. Yeah, there's somebody in one of our morning meetings was saying they, they, they felt like they were addicted to ketone supplements. And I'm like, I was like, ooh, they don't even taste very good. How do you get addicted to that stuff? But I guess maybe they get a little bit of a little little physiological boost and they feel like they, I guess it'd be like drinking coffee. I think coffee tastes awful. So I, like, I'm amazed that people willingly drink the stuff. But anyway, that's I'm weird in that way. Now, I noticed behind you, there's little vials and bottles. And I think those are some supplements. What supplements have you found to be efficacious for some of the things, you know, and all the people, there's a lot of people talk about magnesium and some of these other things and whatnot. I can't read them. They're too small, but maybe just give us a a thought of what do you think is maybe potentially beneficial and why one would want to use it. So I did the uh, um, upgraded formulas, hair tissue mineral analysis test when I first started. And I do feel there were some supplements that were beneficial. Now the one over my other shoulder is my essential oils and stuff, but I also have an organ supplement. The one over my shoulder is actually bone and marrow back there, but the organ-based supplements, because many people, and I get, not everyone has to eat nose to tail, but those that do find the nutrient boost from organs, but they don't necessarily want to eat the organs, that's where the supplement can come in. I have found a quality company. It's a small family-owned company and it is MK supplements, but otherwise magnesium and potassium and electrolytes. So I am a slow metabolizer of sodium. I do better on a higher potassium to sodium ratio. So I do end up and there are some commercial supplements or electrolytes out there that are higher sodium. I don't do as well with those. I do better with higher potassium. How did so you, how did you determine you were a slow sodium metabolizer? 
How did you make the the hair? The hair tissue mineral analysis test, but I also end up and get swelling. So my little fingers will end up and swell up like little sausages. If I end up and I have too much sodium, I just retain it really easy. But if I do a sea salt that is a higher potassium, I do better and I don't feel like I'm retaining. Got it. Okay. So, th- so there's some clinical presentation that like I'm swelling more than I think I should be. Maybe that's part, maybe that's a part of that. So we talked a little about circadian stuff. We talked about grounding. We talked about some of the dietary stuff. What about, yeah, I, I, I see from time to time you're out there doing some strength training. Is that, how has that progressed? Is that something almost completely new to you or is it something you've done for years and you just, I just hadn't noticed it, but what's the story on that? No, other than what I call farm work, like going and cutting and chopping wood and loading wood and that type of thing. I did have a picture on my Instagram in regards of me lifting this heavy log that's almost wider than my body. And I was able to end up and lift it. And I still do a lot of like bucket carrying, traditional farm work, right? Bucket carrying logs, brand, that type of thing, chasing kiddos all day long. That's my workout, carrying a 30 pound kid up and down stairs. But also, yes, I do end up and have my kettlebells. I love the kettlebell just for the full body aspect. Anything that I can end up and do that is stacking the practices. So I get out at sunrise, I swing my kettlebell, and I'm grounding in the process. I do find a better posture, better stance when I do it barefoot versus when I have like shoes on. But then I'll also go for like walks and that type of thing. I live, it's pretty hilly. So it's up and down hills, a little bit rugged terrain, if you will. But yeah, that's pretty much my workout. I have a basement that has a bunch of workout equipment and I do it from time to time. I just find it better when I'm out in nature and able to do it outside. Does your does your diet ever like, you mentioned different ratios. Do you ever like up and down it a little bit or is it always pretty steady? Like I'm always eating 80% fat or, or do you find some days you're, or some targeted reasons you might want to go higher fat or lower fat? So I pretty much do a variation of adequate protein, high fat, fat fasting, and then what I call a refeed day or a refeed week, depending how I'm doing it or what my you know plan is at that point. Cause I'm obviously a data nerd. So I end up and I track it and there's times where I'll do like a refeed week. And then I do three weeks where I'm doing a little bit more fasting, but on that refeed, I do bring the protein up I, to the amounts when we talked in 2020 of where it starts to fluctuate the glucose is where I end up and pretty much take that up to. So it is somewhere between, I would say, a 25 and 35 gram difference on my refeed days. Does it sound like a lot? I realize that's only six ounces of protein, but essentially it's a whole nother meal that I'm adding in there. Yeah, it's you probably know Robert Sykes, who's a bodybuilder, who does ketogenic style body. He talks about similar that he'll titrate based on his protein when it's when it starts messing with his blood glucose a little. That's when he'll back off a little bit. So that's a strategy that he uses. Obviously, when he's getting leaner, he's in quite a caloric deficit, regardless. But let me ask you: you probably know that, like I had was doing jujitsu and rolled my neck and got some kind of a cervical radiculopathy. I've been dealing with that, and so I recently, uh, I think about two weeks ago. So I'm gonna. I know there's some decent data on neuroinflammation and ketosis, and so I've been gearing my diet towards that. So a little bit less frequent meals, a little smaller meals, definitely higher fat percentage. And I got into pretty deep ketosis, the highest number I'd ever seen. I think I saw six one, six point oh, or something like that, which is really deep. And most of the time, I was sitting at two five. And the first four or five days, I didn't notice any difference at all. It's like I don't notice. I don't know. But now I'm two weeks in, and. I'm probably 60, 70% better. It's not gone, but it's better. And part of that may just be, we know the natural history of this injury by 12 weeks, 80% of people see it go away anyways. I can't say for sure, but I know it's it's been, seems to be effective up to this point. Now, I will tell you, I don't enjoy eating that much fat. I just don't. I just don't like eating so much fat. It's just weird. I just, I'm like, I can eat so much. I, eat, I, I love fat on my ribeyes. I eat plenty of ribeye steaks. Once I get up about past about 70, 75% fat, then I'm all of a sudden, oh, and I guess I like to eat. And then I guess it shuts down your appetite or you just, it, it, it almost becomes like almost nausea provoking for me and not to that degree, but I just don't want to do it. So it's been a challenge from that aspect. And that's where I'm thinking, do exogenous ketones have a role in people that just can't tolerate 90% fat for a therapeutic cause? It might be an argument for that. 
depending if that's what's doing it. Assuming that you're doing the other things, sleeping right and exercising and meal timing and all that stuff. But so it's been interesting. What, let me ask you as far as your, you, you've done all this extra additional training and that sort of stuff. Do you, when I know you used to watch kids. Are you still doing that? You had a little kids run, a bunch of little kids running around in the morning, like a mini daycare type of thing. Is that still yep. part of your daily routine? Cause you're talking about managing stress and that's gotta be a little bit of a stress. <laughs> Yep. So 12 hours out of a day, I end up and normally have kids in the house somewhere about six and I usually get done at six, which is why we ended up and had to adjust this time and do it in the evening or afternoon for you. Just to go back, what I would normally tell a person, say, if you were my client and saying that, hey, I just can't eat this much fat. That's where even doing like some of the fat trimmings. So if you can, especially if you can handle the fat off the ribeye, doing the fat trimming so that you have a cooked piece of fat that you take part of the fat, put it with a bite of the meat and take it that way is another easy way to end up and boost that fat or just the suet because cooked suet is like the ribeye fat that it's that same consistency essentially. But yes, managing stress, normally I end up and do daycare 12 hours out of the day. And then I'm also coaching and doing meetings during that time and during or during the evening time. So usually I come up to the office about 6.30 and work till about 9, 9.30 in the evening. Yeah, and you've got, correct me if I'm wrong, I think maybe three kiddos. I can't remember how many kids you had. You had several. I know something like that. Three biological and a stepson. Okay, so four kids in the house. Are they all in the house still? Nope. The only one that's still in the house is my 14-year-old. Otherwise, I have two in college and one out of college. So I have a four soon to be 15 year old, an 18 year old, a 21 year old, and a 25 year old. Okay. Were any of those impacted by your dietary sort of choices they think you're crazy or what what's going on with that stuff i would say they've become more protein focused especially my son while we were in wrestling he definitely would do more of the protein w- during the winter time we usually every year we get either when the kids were all home it was a whole beef but now we end up when we get half a beef process we've supported the same farmer for the last five years so it is grain finished. That's just how Nebraska is. You send them out to pasture, you send them out to stocks, and then you end up and you bring them home, fatten them up and send them to slaughter. But I tolerate it. So I don't need the grass fed grass finished. But when my son was at home, we would make uh, some homemade beef sticks, some homemade summer sausage, brats, those type of things. He wrestled, he's six two and he wrestled at 152. Mm. So very slender, but very muscular. And was able to end up and maintain weight easily with doing more. I wouldn't even say it was a carnivore. I would say it was more protein focused, animal based, but. Yeah. And so you said you you brought in, I think you said you brought in olive oil and I guess olives and avocado oil and I guess avocados. Any other sort of things you've been able to, to utilize? During my seasonal time, I do. I'll end up and I'll do some lettuce. I do cucumbers, green beans, zucchini, squash. I don't do a lot of fruit. I just, I've never really been big on fruit. I have reintroduced it and I've done fine with things like strawberries or some lower glycemic. I think a lot of that is also my mindset in regards of, hey, I don't end up and want the hot things like even a muskmelon or cantaloupe or things like that are more of the high sugar foods. It's just one, it's not tempting or sound good to me, but some of the other foods there, there is a part of me that is appreciative of it when I can end up and take it from seed to plant and grow it on my deck and see what I've grown and then end up and consume it. Yeah. None of those foods you mentioned, all the vegetables, I, I, I would have any desire to eat. It's kind of funny. I never like vegetables. So it's perfect for me. I like, ugh. I got, you can take, I'm, I never eat another vegetable the rest of my life. I like Al Michaels. I don't know if you guys saw that little the sportscaster, he said, has he's never had a vegetable in his whole life. He's like almost 80 years of age now and he's still doing good. He's still working. So it's interesting. What I guess negatives that you've run into by, because I, I try to ask people this. Most people are talking about the positive they've benefited. And you've obviously, let me go, let me go back to the thyroid thing. Cause that's a pretty common thing, particularly with women. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, often replacement hormone is given to check in anti-thyroid hormones or antibodies rather. How did you resolve that, or have you? How you said that's resolved? Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I was on levothyroxine for it, and through diet, but also through the lifestyle. Like I said, managing sleep and stress, and all of those lifestyle practices, getting the body into that parasympathetic, so that the thyroid and the adrenals aren't overtaxed, 
with what I'm doing, making sure that I make good quality sleep, not just the quantity of sleep, but the actual quality of sleep that I'm getting has all played a role in reducing those antibodies. Yeah. Those are back down to relatively normal levels and you're off the horn, off the replacement. Is that, yeah. Yep. Yep. And just, I'm just curious, obviously if you're getting, if you're on, if you're on high, th- thyroid replacement, you probably have a physician that prescribes it. Is that physician like on board with your dietary plan of eating a bunch of fat and tallow sticks and carnivore stuff? Or have you discussed it with them? Yeah, so she is. I did switch physicians. And then also, ultimately, in the last few years, when I told her what I was going to do, she's okay, we'll end up and we'll see. I didn't necessarily tell her that I was going carnivore. Because at the time when I was working with her, I was still keto. And then she's what brought it on actually was she did a urine test. In addition to all the other labs that I had done, And she's, hey, you have ketones in your urine. And I said, Oh, yeah, by the way, I'm doing a keto diet. But then I started to do at-home testing because my insurance shifted. So I wasn't going to the doctor's office because I had the office visit and then the labs and then the office visit to end up and consult after having the labs done. And so I had contacted her office and I told her my scenario of, hey, my insurance has shifted. My husband changed jobs. He got health insurance, but he works for our county department of roads and At the time, they only paid for the employee and it was like over $900 for spouse and children. So we switched over to more of a cost sharing group insurance. It's not even really an insurance, but sharing type deal. And I said, it's pretty much like a major medical. And are you against the fact of as long as I do these at-home tests, give you the results, still monitoring it? And she said, that's fine. But if I need to adjust any medications, I'm going to have you come in. And needless to say, it all kept getting better. And so we started just titrating off. Some of them we were able to stop. The cardiologist that I was seeing, he said, I no longer end up in need to see you. And then she was the final in regards of the thyroid. That was the last thing to finally end up in shift. And like I said, it, I feel that it did take these other practices beyond just nutrition to help fix that. And also, as far as the A1C and dropping in, it took the lifestyle. Yeah, A1C has got to be, what, four something now or something like that? What is it recently? It, it's 4.8 now, and it was 6.0 when I started. Yeah, clearly 4.8 is pretty, pretty good. I think mine last I checked was 5.1 or something like that. Do you, oh yeah, I was going to ask you, negative experiences with this diet? Have you had any like bad things happen to you? Obviously, the elephant in the room, everyone's what about your cholesterol? Any thoughts on that? Do you have, do you run high LD? Because a lot of people, it's surprising. A lot of people don't. They do all this fat and their cholesterol doesn't go. Sometimes it goes down, but I can't remember what your particular situation was or if you wanted to share that. It was high initially. So I think my body was like, whoa, what is this? We're not used to this. So it did it up and go up initially, but it has since come down. Now, I don't, to pick up your question that you asked, I don't really fluctuate with the fat. I have tried. I don't do well, I guess, if you want to consider that the negative also, I don't do well with the lower fat, higher protein, the shredding aspect, or protein sparing modified fast, whatever you end up and you want to call it, term label you want to put on it. I don't do well with that. My mood starts to tank, my energy starts to dip. When I increase that protein, I still get the glycemic rise off of it. And I also end up and get muscle cramps when I start to do it. So for me, it is just keeping the fat in there in one form or another. I do shift it. So maybe during the summertime when I'm doing more or a little bit more carbs, I'll do more of like the olive oil or the avocado oil or even the MCT oil. But really, I ultimately keep, I would say, probably at least an eight fat ratio in there. You've been working with Carnivore Diet for four years. You've been a a wonderful coach and host of meetings and a good resource. In fact, I sent somebody the other day. Somebody's asked me for a coach for accountability. I said, why don't you check out Becky? uh, Because I know you're still doing that. But what what are your plans? Do you have any, do you have, this is what I'm trying to do? Is there something you're trying to do or goals? Or you just keep plugging away with what you're doing? Nope. So I'm actually in several different spaces. So I coach do my own coaching. Yes, it is beckynilescoaching.com. And I have started a community beyond the nutrition because I feel there's definitely the nutrition aspect out there, whether it's carnivore.diet or more in the keto spaces. So I do beyond nutrition where we work on breath work, where we work on mental health and addiction recovery, 
the intuitive steps, like I said, the circadian rhythm, the grounding people that want to know more or want to know how to do that, why to do that. And then also the aromatherapy aspect. And that's just the BNC community.com. But I am out there as a coach. So I am a familiar face in several communities beyond just the carnivore diet. But I've also done studying through the National Academy of Sports Medicine, as well as being certified under the circadian side. Yeah. Interesting. Good for you. I'm trying to think. Becky, anything else? We got a few more minutes. Anything else you want to share or discuss? Not off the top of my head, although I'm sure I'm forgetting some other than we still have the community and I'm a familiar face in carnivore diet. I think I've got six meetings that we end up when we do on the platform every week from the eating fat side of things to co-hosting the fasting sleep meeting um, with Danny and then the ketovore meeting even on Thursdays in addition to intuitive eating and the beginner meeting. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how this space has evolved over the last half decade, really. It's been about five years since it's really, mm-hmm. it's taken off. And now there are carnivore, everybody, I, I can't make a sing. Every time I make a little post on Twitter, I get 400 people saying, yeah, carnivore fix this or that, or this or that. It's pretty cool to see. And we're seeing the growth there. So it's, it's for all the people saying it's a fad diet, I, I don't think so. I think it works in some aspects or form. And so I think... The cream rises to the top. And thank you for being one of the early pioneers. And like, I, and I do, I, I like the beyond nutrition because even though I'm known for nutrition, I'm constantly talking about these other things and particularly exercise and sleep. I think those are some of the big three. And then there's other things, these other things that you've talked about grounding and light, light therapy and, and whatnot, meditation, stress relief, breath work, all those type of things are, they're hot and cold. All those things have potential for certain aspects of it. So it's been, it's been fun. It's been fun to see. Hopefully, we got a lot more ahead of us. I think I, I feel like we're just getting started. I think it's going to be the next uh, decade is going to be is going to be really interesting. So, anyway, yeah. well, Becky, thank you so much. I know it's late for you, and you got to get those nasty blue lights out, <laughs> get some sleep hey. or whatever, and look forward to seeing you around some more. Not a problem. I appreciate it. And like I said, if anyone has any questions, feel free to end up and reach out. All right, thanks. Share your stuff again, Becky, just so somebody wants to reach out. Where do they go? So I am on most social media platforms under I am Becky Niles. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, You can find me on YouTube under Healing the Whole Body Podcast. I end up and I co-host with another gal that has seen success with Beyond the Nutrition aspect. And then my community or my coaching is bnccommunity.com or Becky Niles Coaching. Either way gets to me. But I appreciate it, Sean. I appreciate everything that you have created here. I know five years ago, you had no idea what you would have ended up and created as a community. So I appreciate you and Masa for creating what you are and constantly growing and evolving. Yeah. Thank you for each. Yeah. We create a little bit of a monster, but that's okay. It's a fun monster. All right. <laughs> hey, the rest of you guys. Thanks for your Lark. I see Lark in there from Australia and some of the other folks. Good to see you guys. I'll be back tomorrow. If not, I'll see you guys. Happy weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye. Perfect. Bye-bye. Everybody. Thanks. Bye.